Welcome to the Zanbergen Report, where wealth strategies and pop culture collide. Featuring your distinguished host and certified financial planner, Bart Zandbergen. Welcome to our show of Dream Chasers and Wealth Makers. We're thrilled to be back in the studio today with a new episode of the Zandbergen Report. I'm proud to bring in the movers, shakers, and difference makers who are passionate about showing what they have learned and what you need to know today. And today, I'm very pleased to welcome in studio Janine Verladian, a clinical hypnotherapist and relationship expert. Janine, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Appreciate of, it. Of course. <laughs> so, a clinical hypnotherapist, that, um, how does one become a, cl- a clinical hypnotherapist and what drives that? Uh, well, it was one of the things that I saw as a modality that was huge in healing. Um, and I, in, in what I do, work with people who a lot of the time are trying to get past traumas. Childhood traumas, relationship traumas. And I noticed that a lot of them were coming to me needing more than just trying to go back and recollect moments of their life. They were having trouble accessing. And it was a kind of a push and pull, and, and and then I came, you know, aware of hypnotherapy and how it's it just goes deep, and it's able to access part of your consciousness, your subconscious, that um, brings memories forth that you normally may not remember, or more details about that event, and then you're able to kind of restructure and reframe your ideas about that set moment and move forward in your life. And I'm very goal oriented in my practice. I, I really try to give my clients uh, results. And there's no fast way of moving through painful events, but there are modalities that are there to give people um, opportunity to, to heal in a, in a much more comprehensive way. And yeah. I noticed that being the case. And so I latched on and, and I've been doing it now for. Quite a while. <laughs> Quite a while, so. so it's never say. the same. It's never, all well, over a decade, well over a decade now. Um, but yes, it's, it's been a minute, and it's very enjoyable. It's very gratifying. Yeah. Now, has this been an evolution? Did you start with a different modality, like as a therapist of some sort, or how did, how did you get from wherever you were to where you are? Yeah, um, so the two, I was always kind of in a wellness field. Um, I'm also a certified holistic kinesiologist. So as you go through that, you see that a lot of people have emotional reasons for why they're not getting what they need out of their life. So um, when you notice that and you're able to go there and look at, like I love to say, take out the box, right? So you're, you find someone who's going, everything in my life is working, but my relationship is horrible, or I'm not getting that job I want to our goals aren't being met. A lot of the times, the reason why they're not being met is because the person has some type of belief about themselves that they've accepted a very long time ago. And they're running with it. Whether they are consciously aware of it or not, they are running with it, and it's running them. And it's, it's causing them not to get what they want. Somewhat of a like, self-fulfilling prophecy? Like you believe, you convinced yourself that... Um I'll never get that job, I'll never get that relationship, something like that. So really your inter self believes it? It's almost like you're self sabotaging but you aren't even aware that you're your own wisdom. Mm-hmm. That makes any sense, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, you know, we have a blame game because that's easier, you know, to blame your not your non successes on other people or the environment or COVID or your dog or <laughs> whoever, right? Um, but when you're able to really go, where's my accountability in this? You know, where can I take responsibility and take control of my life without feeling like I'm this wallflower just kind of going through life and letting things happen to me? I do have some control in manifestation over what I want in this life. And those are, hypnotherapy is very, very good for that as well. Because it also allows you to visualize and manifest all the great things that you want in your life, but you can't do that until you undo what the tape is running in your head. Yeah. Yeah. So it's an undo and then kind of a reprogram? Very good. Yes. Very much like that. I always say that it's kind of like it's a tape running in your head over and over, 
and and you kind of know it. You know, everyone knows it. They go through the day, and you, you go to do something, and you're like, oh, no, 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 that. Or don't even try to do that. Or that guy will never like you. Or the, whatever those things are. You hear it, right? And right. you might give it a little second, and then you kind of go on with your day. That runs you. Your beliefs run your actions. Your actions run the results. So it's extremely important that people take what their end goal is and trace it back to your belief system. When they're aligned, you go forward so much faster. But if you're stuck in the past, then that needs attention. Yeah. yeah. Is your, I think I read, are you primarily working with like relationship issues or is it like many different issues that are, that are self-sabotaging? Generally, people will come in because of a relationship problem. Um, either they want one and can't get one, yeah. they need to get out of one, it's toxic, um, or they're somewhere complacent, you know, their their relationship's good, it's not great, they want to see it back where it was before, um, it's not always like, you have to leave them, you know, it's not yeah. always the sad, you know, humdrum, it's the people come in that want to make their marriage work, and that see the value in working hard and, and sticking at it, and there's a lot of people, even with affairs, People get past things. Um, so usually people will come in for relationship issues. And then when we work together and we start to kind of see, you know, you uncover the rocks and we go, where did you first believe this about you? You know, or, well, this has always happened to me. Or this, every time I get into a relationship, this happens, A, B, and C. And then I then, you know, there's a couple things that I tell tell signs I'll look for. When I hear those things, it's like, let's visit that. Because I'm all about, let's not just solve the symptoms. Let's get to the base reason of why you feel this way. And generally, it's a pretty big reason. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you want to work with adults? Do you work with children or teens? The reason I ask is it seems when you describe you know, to reprogram something that you've always done, well, the original programming starts when we're kids, and, and something common that I would hear kids say, I can't do this, I can't do this. And so, is that is it too young to start programming for a child? Not at all. Um, I believe that children who can learn to self, you know, meditate and self-hypnosis, whatever you want to call it, they're kind of two and the same. Um, they are able to handle emotions at an earlier age and also handle negative thoughts that may be coming up for them and learning how to rewire them early on and say, this is what isn't real. I'm telling this to myself and then I'll learn it. Um, I don't work with children just because I, I, my audience tends to be between probably 30 and 60. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just what organically kind of structured for me. Okay. Um, but yes, I do give a lot of advice to parents that are, are dealing with you know kids that are maybe going through some stressful times and tend to COVID and home and can't see friends or possibly going through a tough divorce. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about divorce for a second. So that's an area that you do a lot of work with, correct? I do. Okay. So what are you? What are, what are some of the things that you see primarily there that you're able to help with? Everything. Um, and and it, it doesn't mean like, yeah, you mean everything. It, it's, it's relationships come up everything. From the moment you step out in the morning and you go to work, you're dealing with the boss, you're dealing with people you work with, and you go home, you're dealing with your children. Relationships are everywhere. And so almost anything you're dealing with in your present life, personally or otherwise, is going to run out into your relationships and cause problems. So if you're not balanced within yourself, you're going to have outward issues. So I'm a big believer in accountability. And some people don't like to look at that, mm -hmm. right? It's easier to yeah. blame everyone else or say he was such a jerk. Or, and even in toxic relationships, you do have to own a little bit of it. And even if that is, just I love it. Yeah. Again. So in, in my unprofessional <laughs> situation, because I'm not, um, this is more like dealing with my kids and, and maybe some clients. But if I see something where someone talks about something and has repeated over and over again, and so my response as the mentor might be, you know, if it happens multiple times, is it time to look in the mirror and see, 
you know, not that I'm a bad person, but perhaps I'm making, maybe I made a bad choice, maybe I'm doing something that is causing this. Is that, is that true? Without a doubt. Yeah. And, and that happens, obviously, for men and women. Um, to be able to kind of go, this is, I'm the common denominator in this issue. That's the word, common mm-hmm. denominator. Yeah. And so when you are, you know, saying, maybe I'm inviting this into my life. Now, there may be very many reasons why. One may be that the person grew up in a lot of drama, right? So even though they're no longer in a state of fight or flight, they're no longer in this place of just constant panic and, and you know, uh, confusion, if you will, they're now on their own. They're, they're, living this tri- they're trying to live this peaceful life, but they don't know how to be peaceful. Because that's not their comfortable. So you have to find out what their comfortable is. And sometimes that's chaos. That's drama. So it's true. Some people either look for drama or flourish in drama or need drama. I doubt. And they usually aren't aware of it. Okay. Yeah. But it just follows them. Or they attract it or something. Because I've known people that their entire life is surrounded by drama. Mm Mm-hmm. And I believe a lot of the time the reason is because they're allowing it in their lives. Because they're getting a positive payoff, which sounds just crazy, right? But it's not. Um, If that is what's normal to them, they'll take what should be a normal, everyday, slight downfall or bump in the road and make make it catastrophic. It may be because they're still living in this PTSD thing, you know, and they're kind of looping. And they haven't found their way out of it, how to step out of it. Or they just they just like drama, and they think that that somehow validates them, you know, um, to get attention, um, attention to people. Or uh, we all have our flaws. We all have things about ourselves. And the whole name of the game is as we're going through life is to say, you know what, I I, I really screwed up on that. I'm not going to take that into the next relationship. Or I'm not going to take that into the next day. You know, forget about the relationship. Like, I'm not going to take that with me anymore. Yeah. I'm not going to carry it. Okay. That must be one of the things that you uncover and then okay. expose. You don't like that session much. <laughs> no, they don't like it. No. <laughs> um, so we were talking before we got on air, a word that I, I've heard a lot lately. In the last couple of years, even though the word's been around for centuries, nar- narcissistic or narcissism, that seems to be a much more widely used word. So what does that mean to you and how does that affect the people that he needs in their relationships and so forth? I think there's a lot of explaining what true narcissism is. And even though I don't diagnose, I'm not your girl for that, I, I refer out for that, um, there are a lot of people who sit on the couch and go, he's such a narcissist. And, you know, we have to kind of take a beat, right? It's not because this person's, you know, posting a bunch of selfies after you broke up. It does not yeah. make someone a narcissist. It may make you a little vain. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot of toxicity within the relationship with an individual that's projecting onto other people in their lives when they're truly toxic. And, and so looking at that and not kind of clinging on to this catchphrase because we're seeing a lot of reality TV and we're seeing, you know, it's, it's a buzzword. So you had, I think, what the... the normal or traditional definition of narcissism is, right? Someone, big ego, pictures, and selfies. Well, but, ideas. Yeah, the couple of people in the last couple of years that mentioned it to me, uh, I knew their, or know their ex, um, and they described things were nothing like that. They, they were, they seemed much more humble, they were not selfie, you know, type people, but yet she, um, this happened to be a female, said that he was absolutely a, a narcissist Narcissist. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> um, so, what clinically is the definition of a narcissist? Basically, what you said. So, it's someone who um, takes situations that should be their responsibility and deflects it on other people. Um, they're generally compulsive liars. Uh, they can cheat. Um, they tend to stonewall their partners in relationships. Um, they tend to gaslight their partners in relationships and to making them feel like they've lost their mind or they're not remembering things. Um, that's, I think, one of the most dangerous part of being in a relationship long term, especially for people, uh, men or women. Um, you know, it's, uh, that's really what it's the name of the game. That those are some of the clues you look for yeah. in narcissism is, you know, the way they're treating others. Now, you had mentioned something about, well, he wasn't really that bad. 
So covert narcissists, you know, sometimes are. You see them, you know, you see them as priests, and you see them as counselors, and you see them in different fields. Um, And, yeah, they they may not be taking all the selfies, but they may have this godlike, you know, I'm above everyone, no one's going to apply to me, those type of things. So it's not a one-size-fits-all, no relationship ever that I've, I've seen in my office goes down the same way. They don't have the same stories. So it's extremely broad in trying to make it, you know, a little bit more adaptable to what we're talking about here. But everyone has a different story. And it really is when the person in the relationship with the narcissist feels like they're being controlled, they're not being given the truth, um, they're being diminished, their thoughts and ideas aren't valued in the relationship, um, their, their spouse isn't empathetic, cannot show empathy, no. um, can't bond. Okay. So that description really fits this person that I that I know of. So that's much different than the, the selfie narcissist. And I think that's what people look for, right? I yeah. think they peak, they look for this charismatic, life at a party, they walk in and, you know, it's kind of like everyone knows him to his name, that guy. Yeah. You know? Not always that guy, you yeah. know, and, and they, they're real good at putting on that mask and being something completely different behind closed doors. Yeah, yeah. So I have uh, experienced divorce in many different ways, one myself personally, which wasn't pleasant, and then through many of my clients who have gone through it, and I've, I've, um, because of that, I've studied and got a, a, another designation to help um, assist clients through that process, not legally, but financially. So, um, what do you do, or what do you recommend to help people keep their emotions in check? Because that seems to be at least in the top five um, circumstances where emotions just get completely out of control. It's funny, I just wrote on this, um, I'm writing an upcoming book, and I wrote this in, in one of my chapters yesterday. Uh-huh. Um, and what I basically said was, emotions are not emergencies. So another difference. Um, a lot of time, you'll see that people come in and, and you know, they're just a wreck because they've been through so much. They're just exhausted and they're worn out and they don't want to, they just want peace in their life, you know? So being able to um, have them understand, hey, listen, you need to be logical. It's really hard to be logical when they pull these stunts or if they're using their, their kids as abuse by proxy um, to torture you. It's hard to keep a handle on all of that. So you need to really teach them by case by case basis. It's it's kind of keep it simple, stupid, you know, breathe through it. Like, Call a, a, a sane friend of yours. Say, is this really something that needs my attention, or am I, you know, going overboard with my emotions? You know, reach out to a therapist or coach that you that you trust. But you need to learn how to kind of deal. You need to learn to deal with the stunts they pull. Because if you are truly in a narcissistic relationship, you're leaving or a really toxic divorce. Um, it's really hard to see the forest for the trees, you know, you're in it. So you need to be able to teach them the skills, and which I do, um, of how to understand where to compartmentalize those emotions and how to let them move through you, you know, in a healthy, productive way and not just, you know, drinking cases of wine and, you know, emailing your ex horrible things, you know, <laughs> there's other ways. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, there's obviously a financial side too, right? I work more on the financial side and um, I typically see the non-financial spouse. Um, many times it has to be the woman, it just works out that way. Um, and I have seen the, the emotional pain that they are going through with uncertainty, fear, anxiety, when it comes to money and finance. What do you experience or how do you coach your for that. That's all so real for them. Um, and, you know, it's it's not just for the stay-at-home mom or the corporate woman. It, it hits everyone in a very different, very profound way. And it could be the woman that, that has their own business and, and they're, they're rocking it. But as they went on their relationship, they saw that the narcissist or the toxic one in their family, their spouse, 
you know, slowly took control over those finances. Um, and, and they look back and go, I don't really know what's going on in my financial world anymore. It's really important that they do. It's really important that they log a file and that they, they kind of keep one eye on things and are, you know, they understand what's going on in their household, what's going in and what's coming out. Yeah. That's if you're in the marriage still. But once they leave the marriage, for a lot of women, it's the type of situation that they're just, they're scared. They're scared on, um, you know, let's just say they, they have a nice settlement, okay? Um, and they don't know how to trust because that's been skewed in their last relationship. And one thing that the narcissist tends to do is try to have full financial control over the ex-spouse and try to financially ruin them, which I'm sure you see or hear some over and over. Yes. So when they are met with that and they are dealing with any kind of, you know, stuff that they haven't dealt with yet or in it, it's really hard for them to trust and go, well, let's go ahead and sit down with a financial advisor that I never met. Yeah. Um, so I think empowering women that you you lost your voice maybe there for a minute, um, you can get it back. Um, the fear is it is is just it sucks you the joy from your life. And understanding that knowledge is power. You know, um, stand in your power and and take some chances. And you know, all that you want is on the other side of fear. I hate to stop to just talk in bumper sticker, but it's yeah. true. It's true. A lot of women's fears will never happen, right? Um, and so sometimes it's sitting them on the couch and saying. Okay, how, how, you know, realistic is it that a tsunami will come and, you know, all the banks will be closed and can't get to your money? Like, that's not, not really realistic, right? Yeah. But, um, you know, that they're going through a horrible divorce and maybe they're, they're going to be losing some money and they're worried about their counsel or they're, or they're done with their divorce and now they have to trust someone to handle it and invest it properly. Yeah. And also, too, don't forget one of the big ones for, for, for women and men is how they see money, how their relationship is with money. What they consciously think their relationship is with money may be very, very different. Um, and it may be because a lot of people don't like money, you know? And, and, and we've gone into sessions and what their real relationship is. When you ask them those hard hitting questions, they're like, oh my God, you never realized? My, you know, my dad always used to say, you know, money's the root of all evil. <laughs> and what do I do? I give it away every chance I get, or I spend and spend and spend, and it's because on a subconscious level, I don't believe I'm worthy of it. I don't believe I can make it and hold on to it. I don't believe I can grow my work, my wealth. That's where hypnosis and and talking through those fears is so you know yeah. beneficial. One more thing, and I want to get a little more into the hypnosis process, okay. but you hit a point. I've, I've had some clients, both male or female, um, that have the settlement, and, and in some cases there were millions of dollars, and you hit the point earlier, there was still this still sense of scarcity, it's not enough. Is it going to, no, I, I, I'm not going to make it, I'm not going to survive. Well, they were, clearly <laughs> they were, but there, it was very difficult to show them that, that they really didn't have anything to worry about, and so it's that. That would, I think goes back to what you talked about, that pre-programming of your relationship with money and whatever that was, um, just continues itself. They do, yeah, because, you know, when, when a woman or a man has been through something traumatic, they live in this, well, the, you know, the other shoe's going gonna, gonna to fall, it's going to be a catastrophe, you know, and I'm sure you've sat down with women going, you have 14 homes and, you know, <laughs> and a yacht and yeah. a decree. What, what's yeah. the problem, right? Yeah. You know, you just, I mean, unless you just go and throw it all in red, you're, you're probably going to be fine. But it's, that's logical. But taking them back and going, why do you feel this sense of fear? And, and mostly, I see it a lot in my practice. Of, it's because these women have been controlled and programmed that they'll never be okay without them and that they'll never be able to stand on their own two feet. And this is supposed to be your soft place to fall. Your spouse is supposed to be your rock. And when your person is telling you those things, it's easier to believe sometimes. And so it takes some work to get them to understand that their fears sometimes 
aren't always realistic, and if they are, that there are things you can put in place to protect yourself. Yeah, that's Such as you. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's add an, another layer of complexity uh, to this whole process, COVID. Yeah. So, um, so many negative things have happened just because of, I think, of the pandemic. One, the disease, and two, I think the circumstances of, of, of how we're reacting and what we're doing. But, um, you know, stay-at-home orders and then with bad relationships, mm -hmm. are you seeing the side effects of that? Mm -hmm. Every day. Um, I generally look at some type of email or it's hard. You know, there's no place to hide, right? <laughs> We're just in each other's faces all the time. Yeah. So you, you better like each other. And, and stuff it, on a good relationship. <laughs> yes. And if you don't, if you don't like each other, you're gonna find out real fast because they're gonna let you know. You know, when you're like, they'll go get peanut butter out of a few. You, they're not gonna like when you did that. You just you're gonna get. So um, some of it's funny, and, and you know, I joke with my husband all the time. You know, like he's going to bed at five o'clock. I'm not ready for this. I'm not, you know, I'm not ready for this. What happened? You know, but you're in the house all the time, and you're yeah. meditating, and so only so much you, you know, yeah. do. Yeah. Um, so yeah, people um, for some have had relationship problems for a very long time, as you know. You know, being in a past relationship, they don't show up for help sometimes until it's way too late. Yeah. And so, you know, I think what happened with COVID is it forced us to look at ourselves and reassess our relationships. And, and then also, too, our children are seeing this dynamic. And I think for a lot of parents, they're going, I don't want my children to see this. I don't want them to see the contempt and the arguing and the silent treatments and um, this toxicity. And I think that's also the reason why a lot of people are are kind of calling it quits or going for help or looking for treats or looking to improve their relationships if they're in good relationships they want to make them great. Right. Um, what does, walk us through the best you can the process. So someone wants to work with you and, and what does, what does hypnotherapy look like? You mentioned couch. That was like a giveaway. <laughs> like, oh, the couch. <laughs> the couch. The couch. <laughs> Oh, okay. So you snap your finger. One of those hypnotherapy. You know, no, but it's a great crowd pleaser. Because as soon as I come in with that, like if I'm out with my husband, they're like, "What? Can you make me bark? Can you can, can you make me? Can you make me? Oh, the can be, yeah, yeah." My wife hates that I, as soon as I say that, just like it glaze right over. Yeah. You know, no, no, I, I, I cannot make you do anything you don't want to do. Hypnosis is for really, truly people who are done being miserable. They're done with whatever their issue is. And that's when I see them because if they're like, no, I don't know if I want to break up and make up, and I don't know how to do that, you're not ready. But if you wake up one day and go, you know what? I really think the reason why I'm not getting this or that is because this is holding me back, or a memory resurfaces, or or a relationship challenge, or something you know in your current life comes up, and then goes, that's tied to that. Then they call and they come in, and the first session kind of looks like. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Tell me what the issues are. I want to make sure I'm the right fit for them. Because sometimes they come in and, and they're in the middle of a really, really bad custody hearing. You know, they're in the family law thing and they need a tough hidden attorney and they need, you know, they need people to, to protect them. Okay. So that's a different story. But my client is typically coming to me because they have everything they need. They are kind of like, you know what? I'm good. I feel, for the most part, very stable in my life. I'm really unhappy with this or that. Um, and so then we work through that, and I introduce them to what hypnosis is. And for the yogis in the world, the meditators, they're, they're just, I mean, I, I just have to go, all right, we can start in the barrel. You know, they're, they're in. I mean, it's just so, it's so easy. It's like you're fishing in a barrel. Um, <laughs> but um, there's others that are scared. And, and you just, they don't want to let go because they're like, are you going to put me under? I'm like, no, we don't put anyone under. I, I, you're not going to surgery. This is something that's going to allow you to access feelings, emotions, memories, um, sensory things that, you, that could help you piece together what's going on in your present life. So you, you do lay them down. They lay down. They do. And um, then you relax them into a point where do they... Do they Fall asleep? Are they 
they have. So you don't want that. That's not your goal. (laughs) Yeah, you don't want want snores. Um, But what what can happen is generally I'll induce the hypnosis, and there's a lot of different ways that I do that. I do that really, um, I kind of talk to the client and see what their, uh, are they visual, you know, do they, are they auditory, you know, and, and then I use that to help induce the hypnosis. And, you know, usually the first couple times is delayed hypnosis, just getting used to it, because the more you train your body, the faster and deeper you go in. And then when they get comfortable, we can kind of go to the tougher subjects, but they're always guiding it. So it's not like, hey, you know, I got you in the, on the couch and you wait, you, you know, you hear what you're talking about today. <laughs> it's not like that. You know, it's, it's about, so what do you see now? They, they do it. I just guide them. And if they're off course, and I know this is their goal to talk about this, yeah. that's my job is, is able, you know, getting them able to kind of get to their answers, their aha moments, their healing. Um, and that's a big session. That's usually about a two hour, two and a half hour session. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're, they put in the work and they usually leave with a much different frame of mind if they're ready to go. Mm-hmm. I'm sure I understood this. You said something. Do, does your client need to already know what that historic past thing is that's causing it? Or can they come in just with an open mind knowing that, hey, I really want this relationship to work. I think there's something in my mindset without being able to pinpoint what it is before they see it. Three things came to mind. Sometimes they know exactly. Sometimes they have no clue. And sometimes they come in and say, this is going to sound silly, but they'll kind of come in saying something like, you know, I don't know, but I think, you know, when my when I was younger, like my dad, my mom used to argue a lot, you know, and then, and then when I was like four, I was sexually abused, because anything's like, you know, Wait, huh? what? <laughs> You know, I mean, but like, they don't even realize yeah. that this was traumatic. And they're like, well, it wasn't, you know, to that extreme or that yeah. extreme. And they justify it. The mind's a beautiful thing, but yeah. it protects people. Yeah. So sometimes as, you know, when we're sitting in front of them, we can go, you don't see what I see? <laughs> the, yeah, okay. You know, then you kind of have to guide them. And sometimes I'm wrong. You know, sometimes they, they are on the right path, and, but it's not my journey. And so I think when you take your ego out of it and you provide them their healing and you provide them their space to find what they need out of it, they always get there. Yeah. If you kind of just are there for a minute. Yeah. That's fascinating. That's fascinating. It's hard work. Yeah. It is. That's really cool. It's something else. Yeah. We, um, we're running out of time. Wow, so, that flew by. <laughs> I'll tell you. Oh, great. It was quite fast. Yes. Um, but I, I'm going to keep my tradition, and that is uh, I have the honor at the end of the show of asking my guests their final thought question. All right, so Janine, please share with us your ultimate lesson learned if you're, during your career as a wellness slash um, hypnotherapist. Oh, that's, it's got to be fear. Do something that scares you every day. I'm a big <laughs> believer of that. And... I think when, especially women, um, I mean, I'm not going to get feminist on you, but um, a lot of women, I think, you know, where there's a movement right now, and, you know, they're stepping into, you know, this, even women who are strong, or women who have always been very timid, are going, all right, I can take chances, I can take up space, I can, you know, let my voice be heard, I can not walk in fear all the time, I cannot live defeated. Um, it's it's just getting rid of that fear because, like I said earlier, it, most of the time it isn't even really relevant. It, it is never going to happen. So I think when um, the work I do, and also for me, when I'm afraid of something, I try to tackle it because then you come away going, I can do that, and I can do so much more. Um, yeah. And that's that's the big thing. Oh, that's great. How can people find you? Reach you? Uh, you can find me on my handle, um, Ask J Ask JV. Ask Janine for I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I say Ask JV all the time for other things. And um, JanineBaravian.com. Okay. That's generally how they find me. I'm on Facebook under Janine Baravian. Um, so, yeah. And you were also, I forgot to mention, you are uh, considered a distinct woman. Apparently, <laughs> according to Riviera, uh, Riviera Magazine. I've covered and flown. Dynamic, what did I say? Did I say dynamic? Dynamic women. Dynamic yeah, women, yeah. From, yeah, Riviera Magazine. Well, congratulations on that. Well, thank you. It's, yeah. it's an honor to be chosen. Thank yeah, you. Great. Appreciate it. 
Well, Jane, thanks so much for taking the time. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you for having me. It was great. I, I enjoyed it very much. Terrific. I want to thank everyone who has tuned in, and we look forward to being again in the studio next week. Cheers. <laughs>